Boom. Okay. All right. Thank you, George. Yeah, happy to be here. Okay, give us uh, just so my viewers know who you are. Just give us your uh, your brief CV there, and then we're gonna jump into you've been one of the people down in Atlanta going to court and keeping up with this complex YSL yeah. case. So I'm a former uh, staff writer for the Atlanta Journal Constitution. Um, I currently contribute to uh, Rolling Stone, The Intercept, and uh, Atlanta Magazine. I have a column locally uh, with a local publication called Decaterish. Uh, and I'm working with ProPublica on some uh, reporting around uh, criminal justice issues here in Atlanta. Um, most of my work shows up on the award-winning substack, The Atlanta Objective. And I cover violence in the city. And I've been looking at the YSL case and the Young Club trial at, in terms of its impact on violence in the city of Atlanta. Okay, and just so you know a little more about me, I'm not just a normal gossip YouTuber. My, uh, I got a master's in economics and um, I, at my, sometimes we all devolve into gossip, but I mean, at my best, I'm using crime as a lens to explore social, economic, demographic issues in the United States. Atlanta is, I'm from Detroit. Atlanta is a very interesting, many layered city. Uh, yeah. Along with Memphis, it was the first cities where there was a black urban population, even, I mean, as the Civil War was even ending. So there's a lot of, lot of history there and many layers. You have your old uh, elite, black you got the new gentrification you got still some of the nation's poorest worst neighborhoods ringing downtown you know you got a lot of stuff i did a one of my more favorite stories i did i went on the bluff and i know some people over there and they took me in those apartments that rallo had and oh yeah uh, when were you there uh, maybe right before pandemic okay all right yeah it's a, it would have been an interesting time to go look and I, yeah, I'll send you the story when we're done. And, um, you know, I was on Drummond Street where you just put a thing about the Morehouse owning uh, yeah. a house there. And the guys I knew over there were calling it Drummond Street, Money Street. And I was out there for some hours and it was definitely active. So, uh, but yet downtown is right there, you know? Yeah. So, and Morehouse, of course, owns, uh, or is it Spellman or Morehouse owns some properties over there? Yeah, no, Morehouse, generally we're talking about Morehouse, yeah. Okay, Morehouse, yeah. Okay, so um, some developments in the uh, YSL indictment in the last few days, and I just want some clarification. I'm pretty sure I understand it, but hopefully you can perfectly clarify. While there was evidence suppressed from a 2015 raid, which, you know, we don't know what other evidence the prosecution has, so you really don't know how important that is, but uh, from my understanding, the very key piece of evidence about Doug renting the Hertz rental car uh, that matches the description of the car used in the homicide of Big Nut, that, that subpoena was not suppressed, correct? No, that's still in. So that's, I'm not that's, sure how much of that, that phone is going to stay out. Like, there's a question about that right now. We'll right, right, right. Right. Just be, right, just because that doesn't mean they're not going to appeal it and all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, no, the rental car stuff is still in. Um, okay. And the rental car stuff is important. I'm going to tell you, like, I don't think either of those specific pieces of evidence uh, make or break the, the, the trial. Oh, I'm sure they don't. Uh, we don't know what they have, right? What's your sense of well, we know that there's slowly one guy definitely is making a deal. And by having, so let's talk about the oh, they're importance up to, they're of up having, to four now. Oh, four. Okay. Yeah. And then let's talk about the importance of uh, Walter Murphy and Gunna as part of their plea saying, yes, YSL's a gang. Because if, 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 you can establish that YSL was something that, you know, was a regular label too, but also existed for the purpose of committing criminal acts. You can't say that Jeffrey Young Doug was not the head of it. I mean, he was the star. He was providing the funding. So now if we just establish it's a gang, we've recoded it, and he was the head, it's hard to see 
a way totally of him dancing through the raindrops. So would you agree with that? I think I think Jeffrey Williams is in trouble. Not gonna lie. Um, and of all of the defendants, he is the one that they wanted to nail the most. Um, because he's a leader from their perspective. From their perspective, yeah. Um, so the way, like I spoke with the district attorney's office about all of this. And like the key thing that I took away from that is their view is like if they subtract somebody from the case, does a, does a crime still happen? If a crime still happens with somebody removed from it, then they don't care so much about that guy. That person is a cog that's caught up in it. They believe that without Young Thug, none of the other stuff would have happened. And so ah. they are focused on Young Thug. And it's why they were willing to let somebody like uh, Martinez Arnold, who I actually thought was facing fairly serious charges, all things said and done. And, and tell us about him. So Martinez Arnold is uh, a YSL rapper and gang member. Uh, what's his YSL the, rap? What's his rapper name so people will know? Lil Duke. I'm oh, talking okay. about Lil Duke. Lil Duke. Okay, okay. Lil Duke is a character. Like, and when this movie gets made, and God help us, there's going to be a movie about this at some point. Like, he's a central character and in a, like, he's a Joe Pesci character in, in mm. this good cause. Um, there's a lot of stuff that swirls around him, and he's got a lot of character. Um, let me let me tell give you some of the backstory here that hasn't really been discussed in detail. Um, there was a fight, a robbery, and a fight at a notorious Atlanta club in 2014 called Club Crucial. Yep. Um, Martinez Arnold was picked up on a charge, um, like as a consequence of that fight, and he was in jail. Um, and he was in jail when Nut got killed. Um, Martinez Arnold, I am told, called Jeffrey, but also called one of the guys in the car. And, I, and the thing in the car is. It's in a warrant. I read it. It's in the paper. Um, Martinez Arnold from jail, from a recorded line, called somebody on their cell phone that was in the car when, the, like, a few minutes after the hit went down. And so, like, not only do they have a, a, a voice that call, but because they know the number that was called, they can start going backwards from there and saying, all right, where was this phone at the time of the crime? And they put it at the scene at the crime, and then they matched it to a car that got them the records that all the rest of this stuff. Um, so the idea that Martinez Arnold was able to plea out um, is significant to me in terms of what they're really after, because Part of his plea agreement requires him to take the stand and testify um, truthfully. And they know what Martinez Arnold knows. Like that would have been part of the plea that you didn't see in court is they, did prob they probably asked him all the things. And so they'll hit him with it on, 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 you know, on the stand. Um, the, uh, and they'll ask him to authenticate the phone call and they'll ask him to authenticate the other stuff. And he may not, he, he will authenticate the things that he knows personally because he made a phone call. Um, that might get the phone back in. But what it does is- Oh, that might get the phone. The, oh, that might get the suppressed phone evidence back in. Okay. Yeah, among other things. Like, and it's, I don't think it's an accident that, that Martinez Arnold's plea comes in the day after that hearing like mm. oh okay so that was a partially a react or a strategic reaction i think i so. mean they were gonna plea with him of course but to make sure like oh no we got to make sure we counteract that suppression yeah. so instead of like a plea deal where he was looking at hard time they're like all right screw it we'll let you go just testify oh so it got easy oh his so he just to clarify he did a, a shooting or a murder at the club? 
no, I don't think he, got, I, he may have shot somebody. I don't know. I'd have to look closely. Like I, he, he was picked up on uh, on an ag assault charge, I believe. Okay, okay, ag assault something, something, in 2014. In 2014, okay, something fairly serious, and then he's in this RICO with all these other charges. And the, the day after they suppress, oh, he got, he got out. Then, no, okay. he got out in 2014. In 2015, he was released. Right, right, but I'm saying he's in this indictment with all yeah, the new but he's charges. in this indictment with everybody else. And yes. and uh, and they dropped it all the way down to time served because they need yeah. their testimony about yeah. to get the phone evidence probably back in. Yeah, and if they don't, and if he if he decides to be a butthead on the on the stand or whatnot, like they could say you violated the terms of your plea plea agreement, go to jail for ten. Oh yeah, people has- don't realize that. That's right. Now, speaking of which, let's jump over to Gunner. Now, here's the thing people don't, I mean, unless you've been through it or you sit in those court hearings, it's all fun and games to uh, say, oh, I'm not going to do this and that. But when they put you on the stand and they've given you a deal, you, you, you know, if you start, okay, if you want to play the Fifth Amendment game, then they can just say, okay, we give you immunity right now. Now right. there is no Fifth Amendment. Now you're under obstruction of justice. But if you're on a plea agreement where you have a five or nine year suspended sentence, they can violate that if if yeah. you obstruct justice because that's a new crime. Don't get me wrong. Like they'll like if they if they try for immunity, they're gonna probably need uh, the feds to also extend immunity. Um, and they like and that's an open question. Do you think there's a, a loo- if this doesn't go well for the state of Georgia, is there a looming at least some of these things being covered in a federal situation? Maybe. Hard to- uh, like the thing that I'm specifically interested in, in terms of like the feds coming in is the switch. So young thug, uh, Martinez Arnold, and um, uh, another fellow, uh, uh, Diamante Kent, goes by the name Yak Gotti. Um, we're all at, um, at Thug's house when police arrested them, uh, on the outstanding warrant for this Rico. And when they tossed the house, like there's a, there's a Glock with a switch modification on it. And that's like, there are no circumstances under which you can own that without going to jail. No, no, right. but it's a federal crime as well as a state crime. It's five years. It's five years, and it's straight forward. Like, do you have this? Yes. Do you not have the five hundred dollar federal stamp that allows you to possess this thing? Like, no. never mind whether or not you get a felony. No, you're guilty. That's it. Like, there's the, uh, the only thing you have to prove is possession. Um, thing is, there are three people in the house, so you prove possession by, you know. One guy says, no, it wasn't mine. And then the other guy says, it wasn't mine. And then the third guy says, well, of course it's not mine. But the other two are like, whatever. Like, they're not, they're going to prosecute Thug for that it's gun. It's Thug's house. Thug's paying the rent on the house. Right. I mean, I'm pretty sure that pretty that is the beginning and the end of it. Like, it's his house. Like, if, unless one of the guys had it in his pocket, nothing. Got nothing. Like there's no, there's there's no out there that I can see. Um, Dude, maybe uh, I'm wrong. Yeah. Maybe I'm wrong. Like he's got the best lawyer on the planet. Like, and maybe they can talk to, talk their way out of that. I don't think so. Uh, and now, is it true that Gunner has the same <clears throat> lawyer? <clears throat> excuse me, the Ti. They got Ti that deal. I, uh, I'd have to check. So, That's what they say. Uh, so Gunner's lawyer is Steve Sadow. Uh, whom I've known, uh, you know, for maybe 15 or 20 years. And Steve Sadow is like one of like the the holy triumvirate in town with Brian Steele and um, uh, Drew Finley. Um, And then there's like a a second tier of eight or nine lawyers, all of whom are going to call me and bitch at me because I'm putting them in the second tier. But, um, and then everybody else. Like there are a dozen good defense attorneys in town and then everybody else is overworked. Yeah, yeah, same thing in Detroit. There's a couple, you want to get Steve Fishman, there's a couple people, and then there's everybody else, yeah. Yeah. So uh, is it your 
I mean, this is kind of just a feeling, but like as you're sitting in the court or as you're leaving court and some of the uh, defendants are walking around, did they, when this all went down, did they seem shell-shocked? Like as if, oh my God, we can't believe this happened? Because when you're dealing with real like gangster gangsters, like they know the police are coming they have contingency plans, whether it's the cartel or black gangsters or whoever. But a lot of times these young guys that are just, they're doing things that they're rapping about, that other people are doing. They're in communities full of violence. You're, you're interested or, you know, you're concerned with violence in Atlanta. Things that are pretty serious can seem like not a big deal if your whole life is taking place in that context. Do these guys seem shell-shocked? And a part B of that question is, uh, are Gunna and Thug the only two with good lawyers? Did they pay for any of these other uh, guys? There are a couple lawyers? of other guys there. Got Martinez Arnold's lawyer is pretty solid. Uh, I am very interested in the guy who's representing Janet Stilwell. Um, and uh, Yak Adi's lawyer, uh, is Jay Apt, actually probably should be in the top tier there. Like there, like there are really excellent lawyers. Who's but the problem is, here's the. So I mean, Gotti's got a little money. Gotti's got a little money. Arnold's got a little money. Um, the uh, not a lot of money, but enough to put up a house and hire a lawyer because your life's on the line. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. The uh, like the thing for me is it's not the top tier guys having great lawyers. It's the fact that there are a half a dozen people who are barely represented or unrepresented. There are three defendants right now with three weeks to go to trial who do not have attorneys. Why wouldn't the state have assigned them one? No, they can't find them. They can't find defense attorneys who aren't conflicted. Because oh. Like, oh, because and that's another thing. So for people to understand something, we might all be tried as a gang. But it's my lawyer's responsibility to look out for me. Yeah. And he's supposed to let me know, hey, Al Prophet, you can tell on all your friends and go home. He has to at least inform me of that. Yeah. He's not there to protect George Cheedy. He's there for, to, to, for, to look out for me. So these lawyers, yeah, the, the conflicts of interest and all that gets pretty complicated. It is. So there, there's a tremendous, there, there had been a strain on like the defend, Public Defenders Council because of the pandemic, even going into this. And now you've got to find 28 lawyers who haven't dealt with any of the other clients. 28 there. lawyers. Wow. That's, you think um, about it, that's, that's, a, that's a lot right there. That's right. a lot of damn lawyers for a for a law for a case that could be long and drawn out. But they're expecting this to go the trial to go nine months. Oh, once it starts in February. January, but yes, like so. Yeah, we're they, looking at they, late 2023. Late 2023, maybe October of 2023, before we start wow. seeing verdicts. Um, and so that's the thing. Like, who? Like, can you get a lawyer who's willing to commit? Like they only pay something stupid like three thousand dollars a case for a public defender. Um, oh, for the oh, for the whole case. Though these guys get if they were to get or guys and women if they were to get decent verdicts for their client or get them off, it's marketing. Yeah, there's that. No question. Yeah. But like it's just it's a lot. I've seen, I saw a lawyer. I saw a lawyer have to back out. Um, the, uh, he says, I've just got the case. I'm looking at it. It's way too complex and I am too inexperienced. And the judge was like, no, you, you really do. I like people can't back out of this stuff. You need to, how long have you been an attorney? And the, and the lawyer says six months. Oh. Hire like all of the 20 other lawyers in the room. They all just sort of groan all at once. And then the judge let him out because it was like, oh. you're, you're going to be able wow. to present this guy effectively. Um, but I'm not sure that has representation at all, even like um, like three or four weeks later. Um, the, uh, like, you're, if, who, if any of these guys without lawyers go to trial, they are looking at ineffective defense, uh, ineffective counsel defenses 
on the back end. Um, but they're also they're also um, in criminal cases. You know, I mean, I, I my work is a lot of it is looking into big organized crime stuff of all, primarily African American, but my all kind of stuff. Yeah. And uh, when the big guy has the big lawyer in town, and you leave me in the county jail unbailed out with the public defender, it makes it a lot easier for me to wake up one morning and say, you know what? I think I will sign that plea agreement and get on the stand against them because they clearly don't care about me. Walter Murphy, I was reading his description of, uh, you know, he gets out of jail and he's living in a transitional center and this and that. I don't know what his relationship ended up to be with young thug, but like when you leave casualties along the path, who well, may not be your fault. I mean, I'm sure young thug probably thinks of it like, well, cause it sounds like Walter Murphy was just trying to rob somebody and shot. It sounded pretty retarded his crime. But when you leave those casualties scattered along the path and now he's getting out of prison, he's got to live in a transitional center. And then now I'm freshly indicted for a bunch of stuff that happened when I wasn't even on the street and you sure weren't sending me any money. Very easy to justify in their own mind be turning state's evidence against their former friends who they don't feel like have behaved as friends towards them, correct? That's possible. I don't want to rule it out. I also don't want to try to get in the head of some of these guys. No, like, no, I, no, but... Because yeah. I am not... I'm a nerd-ass dork like in terms of like street stuff I, yeah i don't i didn't grow up around any of this i you know and if it's post wu-tang clan for rap then i need a map and a compass um I, I, I like i part of my part of what i'm trying to do here is come at this fresh in some ways that are like there's a whole industry of music news guys who get into sort of the personal detail of there and that's not what i'm interested i'm interested in the organized crime element just like you it's part of the reason why we're talking uh, because this is organized crime whatever we're talking about like this like there i've seen enough of the evidence to understand that this wasn't these weren't just sort of random people shooting at each other that there was the you know, there's a group here like that was coordinated with one another. Um, that's a, that's not, I'm not, I don't want to get in between like the guilt and innocence questions of YSL and, and in this specific indictment. What I'm saying is um, like street gangs are a real thing in Atlanta, wait, um, and they are tied to the music industry. And the contentions that the district attorney are making with YSL like there are a dozen other street gangs that have a similar profile. The only thing that they're missing is somebody with the, like the, the music clout of Young Thug. And the the money. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but they're like a lot of them just drugs. It's not music. Um, I like one of the things I'm looking, there are two or three things that I'm looking at here. One of them is the degree to which the music industry has effectively been an avenue to launder drug money. Um, and I'm, I'm saying that without making a specific accusation against anyone. Um, oh, it looks like a really easy way to take a million dollars of cocaine money and turn it into a million dollars worth of digital downloads that legitimizes somebody as a musician and washes the cash. Or even seven hundred thousand worth of digital downloads, but it's seven hundred thousand clean. Yeah, and suddenly you've got seven hundred thousand dollars you can go buy a house with, or do, or open a studio, or a restaurant, or something else. Um, you know, and you multiply that by however many rappers that got their start in the game, in the in the street game, and like the problem is, like what you need is you need trials like this in order to start establishing that evidence. Um, and that is the moment where I think you start getting the U.S. Attorney's Office involved in some of these, you know, state level gang and, and drug charges. The, the second thing I'm looking at is the degree to which 
and as an economist, I think you'll respect this. Um, there's a lot of risk involved with being a gangster rapper. Like they get shot and killed completely out of proportion to like the number of them in society. Like if you, you or I being murdered, odds are maybe one in a million. We're older, we're employed, like we're not in the drug game. Uh, we are not like violence seeking individuals. Like we get killed, it's an accident. Like it's a fluke. These guys, it's more like one in a one in a hundred at this point, maybe more. And so you start getting into an actuarial question about what the music labels are thinking with regard to what happens when kill. Well, then they don't have to, if if you get killed and I have a bunch of your songs, it's a win-win for me. It's free marketing and there's less people I got to share. The royalties with, especially guys that are coming from distressed communities, families are not, I mean, this isn't the case for everybody, but certainly some of them, families aren't particularly, say, savvy. It's easy to not send those royalty checks out and no one ever does anything about it. Now, uh, I'm interested in the relation. I, did, do you know much about the, the YFN indictment and how their no. war, what's the centrality of their war and big nut as in that murder? Can you kind of tell us about that world? Because I'm going to speak broadly about it because I, I, I gen, I've spoken to folks who are part of the, of the indictment like both sides uh and other folks who sort of know what happened like and if i'm if i sound like i'm i'm being vague about sourcing here that's deliberate yeah um, yeah yeah the uh so they were all one hat one big happy family in okay. 2013 2014 um and a, a different artist rich homie kwan and young thug had a huge hit in 2014 now, Donovan Thomas, Big Nut, was uh, like a made man with uh, England with Bloods. He was an OG. He was the guy. Um, was he from Atlanta? He was from Atlanta. He was, he was from Atlanta. He was from Atlanta. Like, but he was stamped in with Inglewood and the plug, essentially. Um, but he was also like highly connected to the music industry, which is why he was managing Rich Omi Kwan. He and Rich Omi Kwan's dad. Um, mm. Thug wants to continue the partnership, but he also wants his subset of Bloods, YSL, to be stamped in in exactly the same way. Um, Quan and Quan's dad and um, Donovan Thomas were not interested in pulling like Thug's crew, Thug and Thug's crew in deeper because uh, they didn't trust him uh, and they thought he was a little strange. At least this is how it's described. Oh. Oh, really? Okay. Um, fine. Like, and Thug, by the way, connected to uh, Sex Money Murder, which is a different gang while he was in Juvenile Hall, uh, essentially. And that's sort oh, of like where that oh. started the connections to him getting into the music industry. You know, what's um, funny, I went in 09 when I did a documentary, I went to the Bronx to the project where Sex Money Murder started when they used to have a sign up that said, enter at your own risk. I did a whole documentary up there and I know the father of the founder, Pistol Pete. Like, yeah, I know a lot about oh, So I, I, it just, when you said that, cause that's something I know yeah. a lot about. So that's Thug's thing with Sex Money Murder. So YSL is not Sex Money Murder or is it somehow- vaguely? It's sort of like adjacent to it. And, and the, the specifics there, I don't understand. Like that's like one layer down the gang rabbit hole. Below yeah, where it's, it's it. kind of weird, yeah. But here's the key thing: like that dispute between like Rich Homie Kwan's crew and Richie Hall, Rich Homie Kwan and Big Nut and Young Thug began to metastasize in 2014, and there were a couple of shootings, and then Rich Homie Kwan's dad got shot. Um, mm. Now that, was he a, a street guy supposedly? I don't or think so. I really don't think so. Okay. Um, I don't know think so at least that's not what i'm reading here um there was a an attempt at reconciliation that didn't go anywhere and then things started to boil and the club crucial thing was really set everything off 
when uh, Will Woody got robbed at Club Crucial, everybody's green light went off. That's little Woody was the fellow who went with Young Thug to go rent the car. When, when Martinez Arnold was making phone calls, he was talking about whether or not they were all gonna go to Lil Woody's house after the shooting. Like Lil Woody is at the center of all of this. And Lil Woody is not on this indictment. <laughs> Which for those that don't know, they can often mean they're definite. Now, I, it doesn't necessarily mean anything, but in, in cases I've looked at, if there's someone central who appears to be like, oh, well, you're connected to all these people and you did this huge indictment, why in the hell wouldn't he be mentioned? Woody's in jail. Like Woody was arrested on- So four other people that were indicted though. Murphy yeah. was indicted for crimes that happened while he was in jail. Yeah. No, no, no. What I mean is Woody is indicted. Woody was arrested, I want to say in October of last year after the indictment, but he's stewing in a jail cell right now. For what? Uh, I think it was an ag assault, a weapons charge, a weapons charge. Well, why um, wasn't he indicted? I don't know. I don't know. Um, which is part of the reason why everybody's saying Woody's a snitch, Woody's a snitch, Woody's a snitch. I don't know if Woody's a snitch or not. Like the, uh, I don't think it actually matters because the cops, so here it is. Like Woody has been, has given multiple interviews to the police over the last seven years as he's been arrested for this, that, or the other thing. So, so I don't know if it matters if he actually gets on the stand at this point because they can use the oh, other stuff. He, okay, so he's given useful information. Right, uh, including talking about the car, apparently. So, like, but he's sitting in a jail cell somewhere else. Like, Woody, by the way, is... Oh, they're they're keeping him away. He's not in, like, the Fulton or Cab. Oh, or hell, hell no. Hell no. Oh, so, so uh, then he, he, he's considered to be in danger. Oh, so he, he's in danger. The law enforcement considers to him to be in danger. I very much do. Him and his family. Um, ah, so... That's why he ain't on the indictment. Okay. And I think that might be part of what's going on there. But um, the, uh, like, I, I think he, by the way, as you start, as I start, because I'm looking at all of the shootings that follow. See, after the Donovan Thomas shooting, um, there was like a drive by or two every night for weeks in Atlanta. Like, and like the gangs would just sort of, like whose mother's house, whose aunt's house, whose dad's house, whose brother's house, whose girlfriend's house, like shooting, like just every night, every night. Um, I got a list of 50 different cases. Yeah, uh, so those, those, those 50 all occurred in the space of a couple months or something? So there are 50 that occurred within a space of a couple of months. There are maybe another 25 that occurred over the next in years where people 75 shootings so i mean that 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 is up oh, there a minimum of 75 shootings i think the numbers were more i think the number of shootings is likely in the hundreds plural so that that might like, i'm just thinking about like, who's dead yeah yeah so how many deaths vaguely 20 so or the, something so the the district attorney claimed 50 and it's not 50 but i think a number closer to 25 so that puts it up there with any gang war in the United States, really. Yeah, yeah. I mean, over you know, over that period, over that period of time. I mean, yeah. that's very serious, uh, and that would mean that's accounting for you know twenty five, twenty percent of the murders in the city that year or something. So uh, look, you're spreading twenty five over the course of seven years. So yeah, four, four bunch or five, of but it's a significant number. Um, yeah. you know, it's yeah, a, but it's were, just most, most of them happened in a cut in a shorter you're, you're period. Of time. Like, for like, I was looking at it six or seven in a year looks realistic for some of those years, and especially when you're talking about years where there are only a hundred, like 110, 100 murders in, in a year, seven percent of the murders are this, you know, it's a That's, lot, it's a lot, yeah, it's a lot. And then um, and in the shootings, yeah, right. So was Young so Thug's 
baby's mother getting killed related to this, do you think? So I'm going to be very careful with what I say here. Um, I initially attributed it to the gang war because, of course, I would. Look at all the bodies that have been buried. Um, the district attorney's office and the families involved both say no. And after looking at some of the evidence, I am inclined to agree that it was not directly attributable to the YFN YSL gang war. Um, indirectly, let me tell you, uh, I think that there is a chance that the person who killed the mother of Young Thug's child may be found innocent. Um, and it's because there's video showing that she shot first. Why the hell would she be armed? And why would she be getting into an argument with somebody? And why would she be willing to pull a weapon and shoot? And I think it's because all of this gang war going on, like it's an act, like in her mind would be an act of self-defense. It's like, there are people getting shot. I need to be armed which is very much in the zeitgeist of Atlanta right now, where everybody seems to have a gun. Um, the, uh, if the gang war hadn't been going on, I don't think she would have been walking around like with access to a gun and a willingness to use it. But that doesn't mean that the gang war, she is a victim of the gang war, exactly. Like, like the, the thing to consider... <laughs> Well, no, like I said, it's created the zeitgeist that put her in that frame of mind. The it, the actual incident per se isn't due to that, but the uh, um, the milieu that allowed it to happen is a result, possibly, of the gang war. So much violence. There was so much violence swirling around them for a long period of time, and in particular. Uh, the YFN folks had very, very deliberately targeted family members of Young Thug, both for oh, harassment wow. and threats. Like, Young Thug's children were threatened by YFN Lucci in an Instagram post like six years ago, five years ago. I mean, it's Is, not, it doesn't come out of nowhere. What's the state of uh, the, they, they were indicted earlier, YFN. Are, do, is yeah. there... Is their indictment worse or not as bad, or how's that? Uh, it's just as bad. Lucci goes on trial the same day Young Thug does. They both are slated to start trial on January 9th. Well, to go back to my, when we were giving our introductions and I was talking about how interesting Atlanta is with its many layers of culture, Atlanta is a place that has... Uh, I mean, it's still, there's this element of the racist old South, but there's also that element of elite black families that have been elite for a long time. And they yeah. have struggled to turn Atlanta from that little podunk town whose who's slogan, the city too busy to hate when you really unpack that is kind of a disturbing slogan. It doesn't say we don't hate, yeah. we're too busy yeah, to hate. So they've struggled to turn that into this modern yeah. metropolis and they are not gonna see the kids from those, from the neighborhoods left behind, we'll just say, uh, you know, wreck the billions, the tens of billions of dollars in value that has been created for the old line families of all kinds, black and white there with the increased real estate values, the property development. Uh, and of course, I'm sure you're aware, uh, Metro Atlanta is one of the Metro areas with the least income mobility for black people. So even though it has a lot of wealthy black people, they didn't get wealthy when they came there, they had it or they're part of Atlanta's. So I kind of see this crack down and not saying they're not guilty, but like, if I was part of the Atlanta elite, I would be saying, oh, no, 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 no. We're you're, not going to let this city fall apart. You're, you, you have, that is an astute observation. And I am glad that you've made it. Like, you are wise. Um, and I don't think a lot of people, particularly outside of Atlanta, fundamentally understand the dynamics of what you just described. There are in my opinion, four very distinct social and economic classes within Black Atlanta society. Um, there 
there is a black underclass in society that has no economic mobility essentially oh yeah it's and it's about half of black atlanta uh, maybe more um there is an elite um and they've been an elite for a long time but they're also elite black you know professionals moving to atlanta homestead in here like that exists that's real but it's a small number of people we're talking about five percent of black atlanta like there there are two other sort of very important groups to look at here there are mobile relatively middle class black families that move to atlanta for opportunity as often as not, they're not actually living in the city of Atlanta. They're living in sort of suburban Atlanta. And they're doing exactly what white people are doing. They're chasing schools. They're chasing real estate value and whatnot. Um, but I'm also, to some degree, describing like the sort of old school black middle class. Like the folks who worked for the school system or were cops or worked for at post office. or a post office. And they moved to West Atlanta and have owned their homes for 30 or 40 years and they are retired or retiring for whom all of this stuff around gangs and rap and all the rest, they have almost exactly the same perspective on that that a middle-class white family would have with the exception of, I want to make sure that there are no racially unjust things going on with the police department or the courts. But for the rest of it, it's please don't let gangsters shoot up my house. Like they're exactly the same, exactly the same social social thing. Fourth group of folks were kind of like me. I'm the child of an African immigrant. Um, there is a large African immigrant population in Atlanta that is separate and distinct from all three of those other groups. Um, my point here is uh, the rap stuff is by and large a product of Atlanta's black underclass. And that's their only, and they're, a lot of money does come in because there's a bunch of big rappers, but it's all filtered through a few small set of hands. It's very like a, a, a third world, you know, income inequality. You have yeah. two, two, three millionaires with 500 people and 50 families getting apartments and cars rented for them. Atlanta Under has a higher Gini coefficient than Caracas. Oh, wow. So so for those who don't know what a Gini coefficient is, it's a single number that expresses the income inequality between uh, richest people in society and the poorest. Caracas, Venezuela is, a, is a, the capital of Venezuela, which is right now a country that barely has a government. Yep. Uh, it's one of the uh, highest murder. I may have the highest murder rate of any country in the world. It's Mad Max, fuel shortages, people yeah. getting killed over what's left in the grocery store. Uh, you know, it's it's a failed state. It's almost like uh, getting towards, you know, Somalia and South America and to, and, and South America in general and, and Venezuela in particular, the poor people can barely eat and the rich people are living like they might as well be in Miami. Yeah. And uh, you're saying Atlanta has a higher... Gini coefficient in Caracas, that's true. Yeah, Car higher than Caracas, higher than Rio, higher than um, I mean, wow. than Rio. And it's- oh, well, that's the statistic. Forget the murder rate. That's a hell of a statistic. So and the two are linked. Like the inequality and the, and the homicide rates and the violence are linked. Like there's, and there's a very clear linkage. Like, and it's not just in the United States. But worldwide and it holds up historically. The higher your inequality is and the more concentrated poverty you have, the higher your homicide rate is. Like, and that's fundamentally, that is of the dozen reasons why Atlanta's homicide rate spiked. That is the one that I think you can attribute the most predictive power to. The, the inequality problem is driving everything. And nobody seems to be willing to get really serious about fixing that problem. Like where the job opportunities for poor black kids who are born south of I-20 start to look realistic so that they don't go, well, maybe I'll just go shoot somebody and sell drugs and hopefully my rap career will take off. I mean, that's where that comes from. 
It comes from a lack of opportunities. Like you tell any one of those kids who might be going down this path, yeah, we, we could get you a $50,000 a year job framing houses or something like that. They'll take it like that as long as they know that it's real and that they can see an example of it. But they don't, they can't because everybody around them is messed up. And because like, if you screw up even a little bit under those circumstances, you're damaged to goods and nobody will touch you. Huge problem. Uh, yeah, it's, that's right. Now that's, you just taught me something I didn't know. That's why I knew, I knew it hit, you know, US cities, I'm in LA, right? I'm from Detroit, I'm in LA. Of course, LA has it, but I didn't know Atlanta had higher than Caracas. That is like, wow. But you know, you notice it because as someone from Detroit, I mean, I'm used to some of the worst neighborhoods in America and some of those neighborhoods ringing downtown, yeah. the bluff, Mechanicsville, you know, I don't, the name, like yeah. are nasty and they're little. And because of the geography of Atlanta, that's why you have these little distinct pockets of gang culture and slang and gangs and which makes it interesting from a creative standpoint because a lot of these neighborhoods are just little cut off you know you go down this this set of roads and there's two liquor stores and there's 3200 people and they're their own little world and it's cut mm -hmm. off whereas like cities like detroit and chicago are these big industrial things that are set up for people to come out of their house, get on a main thoroughfare and be taken to a factory. So the culture is more widespread uniform, but there each little pocket can have its own slang. And it, that's why the exoticism, perhaps that's part of what fuels. The, I, hate, uh, it. I yeah. hate that the, the exoticism, it's like, there's a, there was a, an important writer, in, uh, Edward Said, Said, who used to talk about um, Orientalism. Orient, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, this idea that, like, look at this, look at this bizarre foreign culture that I can sort of vicariously take participate in. You know, the problem is people are dying, and like, I begin to question the moral judgment of people who are absorbing and participating in uh, vicariously like gangster rap and trap and drill now drill here in Atlanta. Um, the, uh, the, the degree to which that they bear some moral responsibility for fueling some of this. Um, the, 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 the young thug and wife and Mucci were shooting at each other or their crews were over get, over music beat over music. because it generates yeah more sales uh who i mean because thug was the winner it, it appeared at least in the court of popular opinion uh uh and it results in more spins more uh streams yeah. more money it literally is like and youtube is sort of becoming like this now too it's a battle of who's going to control the corner with the best crack sales. Cause this kind of music and even a lot of this, some of this content where it's gossip about what, Oh, gun is a snitch. Gun is not a snitch. So-and-so who killed more people. It's Why like the giving, hell would that matter it, to somebody giving, who's listening to this? It's giving hits to your brain, just like a drug. So, when I don't, you may have grown up in a calm household, but when you grow up as a child, I did in a household full of extreme things, your brain almost is trained like a drug addict, but it's to respond to like conflict and violence. So you wake up, the first thing you do, look who shot who last night. Oh, so and so called someone a snitch. And uh, it's just like it's it's a stimulant, it's exciting your brain. And when you're you know young or whatever it's just like drugs so this music and then if if you take away if there's no violence from gangster rappers well then they're all just slim jesus and that's no fun i mean uh, this idea that this uh, that authentic uh, that authenticity requires violence bothers me because well, it says that that's 
violence. But if you're talking about violence, yeah, then well, okay. It, if you're it, talking about violence, I understand that. It's just like I, it feels like a minstrel show to me. It feels oh, I just like. Did a, I just did a YouTube thing called The Minstrel Show 2022, and I, I just use that exact phrase. It's very disturbing. As someone who grew up in the 80s in Detroit with America's highest concentration of black population, teachers are black, mayor, police, I am like shocked at what goes on in public now, and nobody, everyone just acts like it's okay. I guess it makes money, and the black middle class and elite is now so disconnected as you know from the poorest sections of the black population as to represent they're a different group so they really have no affinity they do not look at the uh, YSL or YFN indictment and see oh that looks that's my nephew and that's my grandson no 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 none of those guys have aunts and grandmothers that are part of Atlanta's elite because if they did they wouldn't be in that indictment the irony here is that even amongst the black underclass, like, and I'm, I think we need to talk about class more in this country. I'm going to call this a class thing. Like, like I'm going to describe people in poverty as an underclass. Even among people in poverty in Atlanta, virtually none of them are actually engaged in violence. That's right, the thing that's right. absolutely just I'm manic about this. 98% of the black public, rich or poor, has no criminal connections whatsoever. Like we're talking about this, a tiny dysfunctional subset of a group of dispossessed people, like whose dispossession created this dysfunction. Like it's not, it doesn't reflect the broader culture. But this is what the rest of the world is saying must be Atlanta's culture. That must be Atlanta's black culture. That must be Atlanta's poor black culture. And I'm saying, no, it's really not. It's an aberration even within the culture of black poverty in Atlanta. This is a normal shit. And I'm sorry to swear. I, oh, you do your thing. Like the the kind of damage that does to absolutely everybody else, like it damages the ability of a, a poor black kid who's growing up in Mechanicsville to get a job because some racist white guy is going to say, oh, well, you must be a gangster because everybody from there is a gangster because well, look at the music that's getting made. Well, you know, it's even scarier. And just to, to be honest, they don't even have to be racist. If you're not the most, if you're just a white person, you didn't go to college, you're not a bad person, you just don't really know a lot about the world, and all you know of black people in Atlanta is what's shown to you on TV, I don't even think you'd have to be racist to be scared. You really could think, uh-oh, I'm in danger from you, because you don't know any better. Not a person with some education, but, you know, these a lot of those white people down there, they're just living off TV, too, so they don't know anything. And, there's there's uh, one of this music. There's, there's one of the music that's violent. That's the, I guess that's my point. Is that there's way, there should be a way to get to it. Anti-social behavior, drug abuse occurs pretty evenly across all demographics of U.S. society. But it's been, and I think I know why the reason it's been glamorized. Desperate people engage in desperate uh, economic activities. So just yeah. like Jew, Jews used to be boxers in the 1920s, right? Because they true. were Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, and they used to do vaude. They didn't just create Hollywood as the owners. They were the ones. Because they were allowed to do it. Like they and, were, and, like, well, and, and, and they were poor. So you, you, you box, you become criminals, you do uh, entertainment, because these are things that are unlikely to result in money, but might. So now you have a portion of uh, the black population that uh, feels they have to resort to these risky economic chances. Uh, and it's become a linchpin of the entertainment economy. Uh, it's you don't need you know, to get in. Like, I mean, there there it is. You don't need you don't need a state. You don't need to be able to walk in with fifty thousand dollars in order to get. Nope. 
Nope, nope, nope. And if you and if you do need a little money, 10, 20, 30,000 in street cash that you don't have to put into a bank account or anything yeah. can be used. Yeah, this is true. So I hate to say it, I'm going to have to break out. Okay, so cool. That's an awesome interview, and I look forward to talking to you more, and I appreciate it very much. So I'm going to put the link to your, what, your Substack? What do you want people yes. to follow? Uh, yeah, the, the, the Substack, uh, the atlantaobjective.substack.com. Okay, cool. And do you have your own Substack? Well, that's, yeah, you, that's right. Oh, that is yours. That is yours. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay, cool. So I'll put your links. Great talking to you, and I look forward to talking to you uh, again in the near future. Yeah, let's talk to you uh, like in a month or two after the trial's gotten started. Well, I'd like to talk to you about other Atlanta stuff. You seem like you have some of the same interests as me with economy and history and I stuff. I very much do. Let's, yeah, let's, let's talk later. Bam. Have a good day. You too. Bye.